like sa ulit, membrane transport and cellular metabolism or respiration is going to be our lab for pre-lab discussion and it is prepared by yours truly. Let's discuss what you're going to be obtaining after completing this chapter. Describe the key pathways and biochemical reactions of cell respiration. And lastly, to be able to discuss the importance of membrane transport in general, biology of an animal model, and everyday life. As for the outline, this is what we are going to be dealing with. First and foremost, we have the membrane transport followed by overview of chemical reactions or what we call the metabolism and lastly the cell respiration let's now proceed to the membrane function or the movement across the cell there are some molecules that have the freedom to move from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell and the process that we can call to that is the membrane transport. Membranes include solutes and other molecules that can pass through a cell. With the use of the cell wall or the plasma membrane. As you can see on your skin right now, membranes surround the outside of the cell and the organelles inside it. The plasma membrane acts as a selective gatekeeper. When we say gatekeeper, it is the one responsible for regulating what type of substances can enter a cell. It is the one that controls or gives limit to it. Like what I've said from our last um, discussion, not every molecule can pass through the cell, only selective ones. And that is one of the reasons why plasma membrane is selectively permeable. A substance may cross the membrane via diffusion, a mediated transport system, and endocytosis that I will be talking about individually later on. You have heard of these terms before. What is the difference between diffusion and osmosis? The former is the movement of the molecules or solutes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration and this equalizes the concentration make uh, maintaining the equilibrium or the balance again movement of molecules from a low uh, from a high region to lower region that is what diffusion is all about it is down the concentration gradient wherein the solutes are molecules. For example, we have salt that are found in a solution. So again, that is what we call the diffusion. Like what I've said from our first slide, cell membranes are said to be selectively permeable by which water can pass through but not most solutes. Because these solutes that I'm talking about can become foreign bodies or unwanted materials and they have the tendency to deteriorate or destruct the entire cell organelles if they pass through it. That is why they are selectively permeable once again. Gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide as well as urea and lipid soluble solutes can cross the membrane. Lipid is a waste product produced by animals. What about osmosis? On the other hand, when we say osmosis, this is very contrary to diffusion. In osmosis, if there is a membrane between two solutions with unequal concentration of solutes that cannot cross the membrane, water will flow toward the side with less water or with more solute until the two sides have equal concentrations. Similarly to that, this is where the equilibrium takes place. Osmosis is responsible for maintaining the balance of water between the higher and lower concentration. 
So as you can see here, until the two sides have equal concentrations or solutes. Once again, that is the main difference between diffusion and osmosis. For the former, from a high concentration to a lower concentration, and as for the latter, maintaining the equilibrium of solutes in equal concentrations. I hope that is clear to us. This can be exemplified by this figure that you are seeing right now. Take a look at the image. Number a letter, letter A, yeah. Um, the end of a tube containing the 3% salt solution is enclosed by a selectively permeable membrane. And I would like to point out that the membrane is permeable to water but not to the salt. Second image, letter B. When the tube is soaked or completely immense in the water, the water molecules diffuse through the membrane into the tube, causing the salt solution to rise. Because like what I've said a while ago, the membrane is not permeable to salt, only to water. That is why there is a rise of the salt solution, wherein the water has been diluted in the beaker. And for the last one, letter C, solution stops rising when weight of column have equals osmotic pressure because of the fact that the salt solution is not permeable to membrane that is also one of the reasons why the water has been able to pass through the selectively permeable membrane and thus the water rises on this particular column only at this point the hydrostatic pressure is equivalent to osmotic pressure once again. Additional information about diffusion and osmosis. Animals use osmosis to control internal fluid and solute levels in their body. The blood of marine fishes have one-third the salt content of the water, making them hypoosmotic to water. That only indicates everyone that their blood has less salt as compared to the outside water that they are swimming in or exposed to. On the other hand, freshwater fishes have blood that is saltier than the water, making them hyperosmotic to the water. Mas maalat daw po yung dugo ng mga freshwater fishes as compared to marine fishes that could be found in the vast ocean. And for the last one, if the solute concentrations were the same or equal, the two solutions would be isoosmotic because there is the balance between the two concentrations that they have. So once again, we have hypoosmotic. Kapag mas konte yung salt sa lamat sa inside ng fish as compared to the environment, hyperosmotic. Kapag mas saltier yung freshwater fish's blood as compared to the outside water, and when they are the same, it's gonna be isoosmotic. By which tonicity is related to that. It refers to the relative concentration of solutes in the water inside and outside of the cell. When we say hypertonic solution, take a look at this image or illustration that you have here. This is where the solute concentration is higher outside the cell than the inside. And as you can see here, the molecules are much numerous on the outside as compared to the inside, making it hypertonic. And as for the isotonic solution, this is where if the solute concentration outside and inside the cell is equal in amount or molecule. And as you can see here, they are having equal concentration from the inside and outside of the cell. And lastly, hypotonic solution, if the solute concentration is lower outside the cell than the inside. As you can see here, 
This can be exemplified by having two molecules on the outside while having four molecules in the inside. And what do you guys notice? It is very apparent that um, the concentration from the inside is much numerous as compared from the outside. We have hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. So that's it for the diffusion and osmosis. Now let's talk about diffusion through various channels. Charge substances or the substances that have been expelled out of the cell like water and dissolved ions cannot simply diffuse across the cell membrane. And that is because of the fact that they have been eliminated or gotten rid of. They can pass through channels created by transmembrane proteins wherein some channels are open and some are gated channels. When we say gated channels, there is a barrier that hinders the entrance of molecules to the inside of the cell that I will be talking about in these slides that we're going to be having. Gated channels require a signal to open or close them. It can be categorized into two types. We have the chemically gated channels and voltage gated channels. The former, which is right over here on this image that you are seeing right now, open or close when a signaling molecule binds to a binding site on the transmembrane protein. When we say binding, this is the process wherein these channels attract ions for it to be able to be embedded or to be affixed on the surface of the chemically gated channels. So take a look at this image that you are seeing right now. The spherical shape structure are what we call the ions and there is the signal that allows the entrance of the ions causing the gated channels to open triggering its function and as for the latter the vaulted gated channels it opens or close when the ionic charge across the membrane changes or modifies it depends on the substrate that we have here when we say substrate this is the structure that is being embedded or affixed onto the surface of a particular channel. On this case that we have here, this is what we call the gate. And apparently, it is closing or enveloping the entire gated. That prevents the entrance of ions from entering the cell. And when it is open which is exemplified on this image, you can see everyone that the ions can freely pass through the cell when the channel is open. I would also like to point out that surrounding these gated channels are what we call the plasma membrane, having two heads from top to bottom and their tails, you can see here, which are very hydrophilic in nature. So that's it for the gated channels. Now let's discuss the carrier mediated transport. Sugars and amino acids must be able to enter cells and waste products must be eliminated or leave. These molecules cross the membrane with the help of transporter proteins. It can be categorized into three categories. Of course, we have the transporter proteins that are very specific facilitated diffusion and for the last one we have the active transport that i will be talking about individually let's discuss first what facilitated diffusion is all about in facilitated diffusion the transporter protein that you can see here right now this bean shaped structure binds to the substrate molecule on one side of the plasma or cell membrane then changes its shape to release it on the other side it also takes place in the direction of the concentration gradient when you encounter the term concentration gradient this is where the equilibrium of the concentration occurs or takes place which is exemplified on this 
illustration that you are seeing on your screen right now. So once again, we have the ions that are being bounded onto the transporter molecule or proteins. And as for the region of the cell, the upper part is the outside of the cell and the lower portion is the inside of the cell wherein you can come across the various cellular organelles that could be found suspended in the cytosol. And once again, I would like to point out that surrounding the transporter molecule is a series of phospholipid bilayer in the form of these heads that are globular in shape that are very hydrophobic and as for the tails hydrophilic once again so that's it for the facilitated diffusion as the word implies facilitate which means making something easier or more convenient to be utilized so what about active transport? It requires energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate to transport molecules in the direction opposite the concentration gradient. These are the various steps that are involved in active transport. As you can see here on your screen right now, once again, we have the transporter molecules or protein wherein three ions of Na plus bind to the interior end of the transporter. These are the holes that I am talking about and these ions will eventually be affixed or um, bound onto these holes that you are seeing right now. And as for the step two, the complex binds a molecule of ATP and cleaves it. So when we say cleave, it is the process of splitting ATP into adenosine diphosphate. Like what I've said a while ago, once the 3Na plus have been bounded on this substrate, it will give rise to the production of ATP. And for the step 3, the 3Na plus ions are released to the exterior and 2K plus ions bind to the transporter which is exemplified or displayed on these phenomena that we have here as the na plus leave the transporter ions we have the entrance of 2k plus and lastly step number four the phosphate is released and the 2k plus ions move into the cell because of the departure of the na plus allowing the entrance of 2k plus inside the cell and that is what active transport is all about and again it requires atp to take place or occur and for the last one let's discuss the endocytosis it's the ingestion of material by cells it can be divided into three types we have the phagocytosis pinocytosis and for the last one, receptor mediated endocytosis. For the former, it is said to be cell eating, a method of feeding by single cell organisms, which is shown on this image right now. We have unwanted foreign body in the form of microbe that can cause a virus or a particular disease. The main function of phagocytosis is that it's going to engulf or consume this microbe by utilizing digestive enzymes that can kill or destroy this microbe that has a potential to cause an illness or disease and it will be it will be enclosed via membrane enclosed vesicle and for this um, region you can see that the microbe has been destructed or broken down into smaller particles that obstructed it disabling the occurrence of virus in in a body so what about pinocytosis this is where small molecules or ions are enclosed in vesicles called caviole this is the small vesicle that i am talking about and with the aid of calvulae it allows the 
molecules to be enclosed by it using receptors and translocation to opposite side of cell in the form of transcytosis. When we say translocation, this is the movement of one molecule of a cell to other region of the cell. And one thing that I would like to take note of is that these small molecules will be discharged from the cell because of this process, specifically the calvule day. <clears throat> okay, kaya pa. Wait lang, class. Lastly po, yung receptor mediated endocytosis, a method of bringing large molecules into a cell with the help of the protein called clathrin. Some examples of large macromolecules include ligands, which could be found in most cells of the animals. It will be coated with clathrin pith, and the entire clathrin is protruding from the cell wall. And after quite some time, the ligands will travel down the vesicle, which will eventually coat it and giving rise to receptors and ligands are dissociated. When we say dissociated, it is the process of the separation of one molecule from another molecule. And from there, receptors and membranes are recycled, enabling the um, excretion of the ligands from the cell body. So that's it for the endocytosis. Now let's proceed to exocytosis. Membranes of a vesicle inside the cell can fuse with the plasma membrane to discharge the contents of the vesicle outside the cell. And as for the transcytosis, a substance may be picked up on one side of the cell, transported completely across the cell, and discharged on the other side. So that is the main difference between exo and transcytosis. Now, for the last part of our topic, let's talk about the cellular metabolism, which refers to all of the chemical processes or activities that occur or take place inside the living cells. So here, we are going to discuss the various cellular processes that are involved inside the cell. Before we dive into that, let's talk about the major factor when it comes to the cellular organism, a cellular, cellular meta metabolism, which is the ATP or adenosine triphosphate. We are going to deal with its importance first. Endergonic reactions require energy to proceed, wherein coupling an energy requiring reaction with an energy yielding reaction can drive endergonic reactions. Again, kapag sinabing endergonic, it requires an ample amount of energy, and that is contrary to the opposite term, which is the exergonic. It does not require energy or amount of ATP to produce or to generate. Adenosine triphosphate or ATP is said to be the most common intermediate in coupled reactions because it allows the conversion of ATP to a form of energy to be utilized by animals when they are moving or exhibiting any form of locomotion including us humans how are we going to function if we don't have enough atp inside our body that takes place in our cells definitely atp is said to be composed of adenosine in the form of adenine plus ribose and a triphosphate group the bonds between the phosphate groups are high energy bonds which can be catalyzed in a series of APPP. Take a look at this structure that we have here. This is the entire ATP structure that we have here composed of molecules, specifically carbon molecules that are um, affixed together. We have adenine, um, ribose, and lastly the tri triphosphate. 
and for the image letter B you can see the formation of ATP from ADP and AMP. ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate and AMP stands for adenosine monophosphate and of course ATP is adenosine triphosphate and that is how they are functioning together with this figure that you have here. Phosphates have negative charges, not positive. It takes a lot of energy to hold three ATP in a row. It is now ready to spring apart and that is why ATP is very reactive to various chemical reactions and cellular processes. This image or model that you are seeing right now shows the structure of ATP, wherein carbon is shown in black color, nitrogen in blue, oxygen red, and orange phosphate, comprised of adenine, ribose, and triphosphate group, which are exemplified on the lower portion of the section of ATP. A coupled reaction is a system of two reactions linked by an energy shuttle in the form of adenosine triphosphate wherein substrate B is a fuel. Examples include glucose or lipid. ATP is said to be not a storehouse of energy but it is used as soon as it's available. Take a look at this figure that you have here. The first portion exhibit endergonic reaction and like what I've said a while ago, it requires an input of energy in the form of ATP to proceed, which is contrary to exergonic reaction, does not require any form of energy. I would like to reiterate everyone that the conversion of substrate letter A to product A will not be possible or will not occur simultaneously without having an access to energy endergonically. And that is why for you to be able to produce an enzyme, an ample amount of ATP is required for the occurrence of the process, which is very contrary to enzyme B. Like what I've said a while ago, exergonic reaction does not require any energy to proceed and that is why it only utilizes ADP or adenosine diphosphate and for the endergonic reaction it utilizes ATP having three phosphate groups making it triphosphate. I hope that is clear to everyone. Now, let's discuss the oxidation, reduction, or what we call the redox reaction. This is where an atom that loses an electron has been oxidized. Oxygen is said to be a common electron acceptor. An atom that gains an electron has been reduced that can lead to having a higher energy. Now, this image or model shows the redox reaction that we have here. The molecule on the left has been lost due to the loss of electron while the molecule on the right has been lost with the addition of reduction substance which is shown on this model that you have here, the oxidation and reduction. When we say oxidation or from the word implies oxidize, it is the process wherein a chemical has been combined with oxygen. So yun po ang meaning ng oxidation. Redox reactions always occur in pairs. One atom loses the electron while the other gains the electron. Energy is said to be transferred from one atom to another via redox reactions. Okay, for the last part, of our pre-lab discussion, it is all about cellular respiration. This is where the oxidation of food molecules are conveyed to obtain energy. Electrons are stripped away, 
and it is different from breathing or respiration, wherein gas exchange is highly involved. Let's discuss the difference between aerobic versus anaerobic metabolism. In the case of heterotrophs, it can be categorized into two organisms. We have aerobes and anaerobes. The former use molecular oxygen as the final electron acceptor, and for the latter, they use other molecules as final electron acceptor, and that is why energy yield is much lower than the ATP yield. Okay. When oxygen acts as the final electron, acceptor that is in the case of aerobes that undergo cellular respiration wherein almost 20 times more energy is released than if another acceptor is utilized or in the case of anaerobes one of the advantages of aerobic metabolism is that a smaller quantity of food is required to maintain given rate of metabolism which is very opposite to the aerobes that require a large amount of food to proceed with the rate of metabolism. In aerobic respiration, ATP forms as electrons are harvested, transferred along the ETC, which stands for electron transport chain, and eventually donated to O2 gas. For this process, oxygen is required because it is aerobic. Glucose is completely oxidized. Again, kapag sinabing oxidized, this is where the sugar is mixed or combined with the oxygen. And for the general formula for aerobic respiration, kindly refer to this formula that we have here. So we have C6. H12O6 plus 6O2 which is equivalent to 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus energy or in the form of ATP. C6H2H12O6 is heat, 6O2 is glucose dioxide and H2O is of course water. Cellular respiration is comprised of three stages. So this is what I will be talking about. Food is said to be digested to break into smaller pieces and there is no energy production that occurs here. The first process of cellular respiration is what we call as glycolysis. It is a coupled reaction that is used to be able to generate or make ATP. It occurs in cytoplasm and it does not require oxygen. Second process of cellular respiration is oxidation. It harvests electrons and uses their energy to power ATP production. Since we are talking about ATP, it only occurs in mitochondria and it is more powerful in nature kindly take a look at this image that i have provided we have the various stages of cellular respiration starting from stage one stage two and stage three let's talk about the digestion of food molecules to smaller units in the form of fats it will convert into fatty acids and glycerol for the carbohydrates they are mostly converted into glucose and other um, forms of sugars which includes fructose as well and for the proteins it will be broken down into amino acids and these converted molecules will then be utilized in glycolysis and it will be transported to pyruvic acid to be utilized in the occurrence of Krebs cycle. That is why on the stage 2, small molecules are converted to be able to produce acetyl-CoA which is responsible for the giving rise of the Krebs cycle process that I will be talking about later on. And lastly, the final common pathway for oxidation of fuel molecules takes place 
in the Krebs cycle, wherein adenosine triphosphate are produced by the um, the lost electron that is located right over here that will undergo electron transport chain or ETC process, also yielding an ample amount of ATP. Okay, next slide. When we say anaerobic respiration, it is very different from the former, which is aerobic. It occurs in the absence of X oxygen. So aer aerobic occurs with the presence, but for this one, anaerobic absence. Different electron acceptors are utilized instead of oxygen. This includes sulfur or nitrate. Sugars are not completely oxidized, so it does not generate as many or as much ATP. Okay, to further give you the additional information about glycolysis, this is the first stage in cellular respiration. It is a series of enzyme catalyzed reaction. When we say catalyze, it is responsible for giving result to our particular process. Glucose is converted to pyruvic acid to be used in ATP. A small number of ATPs made, we have two per glucose molecule, but it is possible in the absence of molecule of oxygen. I would like to reiterate that all or organisms utilize glycolysis as their process in their body via homeostasis. Okay, uphill portion, which is right over here, primes the fuel with phosphates. It utilizes two ATPs per carbon molecule. Second step is that the fuel is cleaved into 3C sugars, which undergo oxidation, yielding NAD plus that accepts electrons and 1H plus to produce NADH. It serves as a carrier to move high energy electrons to the final electron transport chain. And as for the downhill portion, it produces two ATPs per 3C sugar, having four in total, wherein the net production of two ATPs per glucose molecule. To further discuss that, take a look at this entire glycolysis process. Glucose has been phosphorylated into a higher energy level by means of the production of 2 ATP and 2 ADP. So, the high energy fructose 1,6 biphosphate is now then converted into triphosphate, which is then oxidized to produce pyruvic acid, which is right over here. I would also like to point out everyone that the glucose as well as the six molecules that we have here, one, two, three, four, five, six, namely three phosphoglyceraldehyde, one, three diphosphoglyceric acid, three phosphoglyceric acid, two phosphoglyceric acid, and phosphoenol pyruvic acid, what do they have in common? They all produce or yield ATP and NAD plus to be able to undergo the process of Krebs cycle. Again, they are what we call monosaccharide group, having only one molecule per, um, per yield, which is exemplified on this model that we have here. Okay. This is just the summary of the enzymatically catalyzed reactions in glycolysis. So like what I've said a while ago, we have the catalyzed glucose plus 2 ADP or adenosine diphosphate plus 2P plus 2 NAD plus equivalent to 2 pyruvic acid plus 2 NADH plus 2 ATP. If you would like to, normal, to know more about glycolysis, kindly watch the YouTube video that is presented here. So here is the link. Click on it lang kung gusto nyong panoorin. Okay, now let's discuss the initial process in Krebs cycle. 
when oxygen is available, a second oxidative stage of cellular respiration takes place. The first step is that it oxidizes the three carbon pyruvate in the mitochondria, forming acetyl CoA. Next, acetyl CoA is oxidized in the Krebs cycle. Again, kapag sinabing oxidize, you are combining chemical into oxygen. And how do we produce acetyl CoA, which is being utilized in the process of Krebs cycle? The three carbon pyruvate loses a carbon producing an acetyl group. And what do you call the removal of carboxyl group from a group of acetyl group? And that is what we call decarboxylation. Okay, electrons are transferred to NAD+, forming NADH. And lastly, the acetyl group combines with COA, forming acetyl-CoA. It is now ready for use in the Krebs cycle. So this is exemplified on this image that you are seeing right now. So for this structure, we can see the pyruvic acid. It will then be converted to acetyl-CoA by means of the utilization of both CoA, NADH, and CO2 forming together to produce acetyl-CoA. Now, for our final slide that we have here, let's talk about the Krebs cycle. It is the next stage in oxidative respiration and it takes place in the mitochondria. Acetyl-CoA joins the cycle, binding to a 4-carbon molecule to form a 6-carbon molecule. Two carbons have been removed as CO2 via the process of decarboxylation. Their electrons are donated to NAD+, and lastly, we have four carbons molecules left, yielding two NADH. More electrons are extracted, and the original four-carbon material is regenerated, yielding one ATP, one NADH, and one FADH2. And for the simplified process of Krebs cycle, kindly refer to this illustration that we have here. The first step here is that the cycle begins with 2C-acetyl-CoA, which is shown on this um, portion, condensing with 4C-oxaloacetic acid and forming 6C-citric acid. Just count the molecules for your reference. 2-acetyl-CoA, so we have two molecules, 4 oxaloacetic acid, 1, 2, 3, 4. And for the 6 citric acid, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. COA is released to react with pyruvic acid. And for our second process, an isomer of citric acid is oxidized by NAD+, producing 5C ketoglutaric acid, NAD plus, uh, NADH rather, and a molecule of CO2, which is right over here. It is followed by oxidation by NAD plus occurs again, yielding 4C succinic acid, which is right over here, NAD plus, and the presence of CO2. And for the fourth step, one molecule of ATP is formed directly with each cycle. So we have adenosine diphosphate, adenosine um, triphosphate, and lastly the GDP and GTP. And for the fifth step, another oxidation by FAD yields FAD+, plus, which is shown right over here. And for the last process of Krebs cycle, a final oxidation by NAD plus yields NADH and returns the cycle to its starting point. So what I'm trying to imply here is that the entire Krebs cycle is all about conversion of acids starting from acetyl-CoA until it repeats the cycle over and over again. Okay, each glucose provides two pyruvates, therefore two turns of the Krebs cycle. And lastly, glucose is completely consumed during the cellular respiration. And for the entire 
structure of the Krebs cycle, kindly refer to this structure. And if you would like, you can watch the video showing you how Krebs cycle works. So ayun lang yung ating pre-lab discussion for activity number 4, tama? And now I will present to you the lab activity that you will do once again as a group. So group work po ulit siya para mas mapadali, ma-accomplish. Papakita ko lang siya sa inyo. So here it is. Here we. So, activity number four is entitled Cellular Respiration and Membrane Transport. Just go through the introduction as well as the objectives and for the materials, you will be needing a strong access to internet, access to Google Scholar, laptop, video conferencing apps, and also a notebook, a pen, or a pencil. For the first procedure, you will be doing the applications of concepts on cell respiration through recorded simulation, and you will be required to watch the video on the lab procedures on evaluating amounts of respective substances in response to exercise through the following link. If I'm not mistaken, it is it has a duration of 22 minutes. So, papanoodin nyo po siya sa YouTube link na nakaprovide on this portion. Number two, you have to tabulate all the data presented in the video and interpret each based on your understanding on the concepts of cellular respiration and compile the major takeaways of the group and write it in your worksheet. And for the letter B, observing RBCs under different osmotic condition, watch the video on the response of human RBCs to three osmotic conditions through the following link, which is provided below. So, i-copy nyo lang po yung link sa inyong browser and panuorin nyo po siya. You have to draw the RBCs in each solution in your worksheet. Select magnification higher than 400 times for your illustration. Make also screenshots of these cells and attach your screenshots to worksheet po. And discuss the probable reason why these cells appear differently with respect on the different solutions used. And do not forget to cite your references. And this is how I grade your lab worksheet. So make sure that you comply with this. Pakibasa po. And now let's proceed sa worksheet na gagawin nyo. Ito siya. Again, write your group leader as well as the group members. So, ito yung table 1 wherein you're going to compile your data. You can write here your title and you can delete it once you are through with that. And also, your discussion answer here. Okay, wait lang, class. Okay, sorry for that. I just needed to take a piss because I've been holding my my piss for quite some time. So I needed to release it. 
Ayun, okay na ako. So, ayun, sa second video, di ba, you have to watch the observation of RBCs under different um, solution, isotonic, um, hypertonic, and isoosmotic. Just put your screenshots here on the section provided, and you have to write appropriate figure level. And don't forget to write your short discussion or interpretations here. And lastly, for your references, cite it just in case that you have in APA format dapat. And for the matrix of work assignments, just like the previous session that we've had, you have to input your group members, their specific contribution, and I will be the one to rate them regarding kung gano ba ka impactful yung kanilang contribution na ginawa. Yun po yung lab for worksheet as well as the introduction to it you will just watch two youtube videos kung saan you need to tabulate your data and interpret it as well as taking screenshots of the red blood cell under different osmotic pressure so you can accomplish this as a group so now do you have any questions so far clarifications that you'd like to raise or is everything clear naman okay pero kung may katanungan you can send me a personal message on my FB messenger account again yung sa cell model you will be passing it next week on Friday October 21st if I'm not mistaken so I hope that you can bring it with you as you enter the campus. Meron na pong nagpasa yung group nila, Jenny. Ayun, andito siya sa aking boarding house. Ay sa dorm pala, naka-display siya. And yes, sana makapag-pass na lahat sa October 21st. During our second F2F class about animal tissues naman, yung activity that you will be complying with so are you guys sure no more questions so far Aubrey go ahead nakapag recite marami ba sila oo nga marami nga kasi ano lang kayo nag recite 25 so anong gagawin natin sa kanila That is 50 points, equivalent to 30% of your grades. So yeah, I will give them a chance naman. Okay, Kiana. You will, you will be bringing a lengthwise sheet of paper. Don't forget that, ha? Tapos, a ball pen, of course. Ang coverage po ng inyong quiz is from the animal cell lab number 3 up to the lab number 4 yung diniscuss ko today I will be sending you the instructional materials as your reviewer so be prepared for that and I guess mas magiging madali na lang yun kasi we've just had our recitation parang reviewer na rin siya so yun the traditional taking of quiz Paper and pencil, yun. So be prepared for it, everyone. Um, any more questions before I dismiss the class? I will, ano, um, naka, what do you call it? Meron akong laptop, tas nakasulat yung question dun para makita nyo, yun. Ganun kasi ginawa ko sa mga fourth year na bio. Nagpakuis ako sa kanila. And mataas naman yung scores nila so far. Yes, Juliana. Yeah. Oo. Lalabas yun lahat sa quiz nyo. Madali lang siya, class. It's a very easy quiz. I'm telling you, hindi ko naman kayo papahirapan. Basta ano lang, enumeration, 
um, tapos true or false identification yun lang ganun lang ako magpa-quiz mga 20 points depende pala so mag-review everyone lecture 3 ay lab 3 and lab 4 ang coverage ng quiz nyo on October 21st any more questions? may tan pa pala akong class Clear na ba? Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Regarding the activity 4, sana clear yun ha. And ma-accomplish siya na as a group. Kasi you will be watching videos lang naman. That's it. If everything is clear, once again, thank you so much. Be a psych 2-1 for your time. I hope that you spend the rest of the day feeling so grateful for everything that you have right now. The class is now adjourned. This is Sir Rai once again. See you next week for our F2F class. Bye everyone. You may now live the meeting room. Thank you. Salamat.